flies back to Phoenix tomorrow, uh, Prescott, amen, and he goes home. But we really appreciate his ministry, him coming here, and I'm sure we would say that we've been blessed by his ministry, we've been blessed by his leadership. You know, let's show him appreciation as he comes to minister tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to get my timer. Preachers should time themselves. They don't preach too long. Amen. Good evening. I am going to encourage you on the final night. Is that all right with you? And uh, give you a challenge to help you believe God. Uh, turn into your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. I've had a great time in the uh, conference and wonderful fellowship. Uh, it is wonderful to see the development of the pastors and the increase in, in all that God is doing. So uh, it was a great privilege to be here. Thank you, for Pastor Brown, for the invitation. And uh, I'm believing God for greater things. Amen. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> in 2002, a clerical worker at a hospital here in London was supposed to send out a form letter telling people that their operations had been postponed, but hit a wrong button. And so instead, 30 people got a letter saying, your doctor is in, uh, pleased to inform you that you're expecting a baby. <laughs> so first of all, imagine if you're a lady, you're coming in for some minor surgical procedure and you get the news you're pregnant the worst part was that six elderly men also got that letter <laughs> imagine that would be quite a quite a shock wouldn't it but then again you know the basis of christianity is an impossible pregnancy isn't it is mary was uh, uh, pregnant by the Holy Spirit, a miracle. The text that we're going to read, the disciples are facing an impossible situation, something that they absolutely have no power to change. So Jesus is going to change that, but uses it as a lesson for all of us. He says, nothing is Impossible. I want to preach about the God of the impossible. We're going to read Matthew 17, just verse 19 and 20. The disciples came then to privately, uh, came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, listen to this, and nothing will be impossible for you. God of the impossible. Let's begin. Let's talk about impossible situations. In this text, Jesus is making the disciples face the impossible. Verse 20, nothing shall be impossible. Impossible by definition is not able to occur, not able to exist, or not able to be done. Every person here, no doubt every person watching online, you have areas of your life that you view as being impossible. For some, it is things that are beyond human ability. The context is our, the disciples were facing a demon spirit, someone who was demon-possessed. That is supernatural. And I declare to you, you cannot fix supernatural problems with natural power. So some people, they see supernatural things and they say that is impossible. Others, it's beyond personal ability. There are things that they just simply are not good at or do not possess the talent. Moses said, I cannot be a spokesman for God because I can't speak well. I stutter. There are people here that maybe it is God has given you a calling. He said that would be impossible. I don't have what it takes 
And then, of course, there are things that are beyond our experience. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. There are things that are beyond our age, life experience, and whatever it might be. So, here is the problem that the disciples face. It's the same one we do. When faced with an impossible situation, we measure God's ability by our ability. And listen, your ability and God's ability, they are not the same thing at all. We measure by our understanding. Often in life, we say, okay, God promises and he says he, but how could this possibly work out? John 6, 8 and 9, Andrew uh, spoke up, said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? I, I don't get it. He's, he's doing the math. He's calculating. And, and he says, uh, I, I don't get it. It, it. How could we possibly do this? We measure by what we see. In life, we can see the problem. We know how big. We know how long. We, we understand all of the factors. And we're like the, uh, the servant of Elisha who got up the next morning, an army with horses in 2 Kings 6.15. An army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. And he said, oh, my Lord, what shall we do? We look at our bills versus our income. We look at the costs in what we need. I was having a conversation last night here in London and in the UK getting buildings to be able to buy a building. Yeah, but with the cost of buildings, that would be impossible. We see that. Those are things that we can look at. We look at the reactions of our family when we witness to them. Far from them having a tear in their eye and nodding in their head, uh, nodding their head when we told them about Jesus. Some of them, they got angry and they said, I will never go to that church. Any of you ever have family who said, never? Just out of curiosity, how many of you said, I will never get saved and go to that church? We measure by past experience. This is what's happening in this uh, Verse, they, the disciples tried, but it didn't work. And no doubt every person here, you have areas of life, you say, I tried, I prayed, I stood in a prayer line, the evangelist prayed, the pastor prayed, everybody, listen, it's not working. The disciples said, we fished all night, but we caught nothing. That is our experience Years ago, I had a, a man come to me and talk about his marriage problems. And I said, brother, God can help you. And, and immediately he said, yeah, but listen, it's been this way for 15 years. So in other words, the time length or time frame, how long it's been happening, that is how you're measuring. And then we measure by other people's words. Let me, let me give you a word of advice. Any time you start to believe God, the devil will make sure some helpful soul will tell you it'll never work. Always. You have people there. It's not going to be fixed. That's just the way it is. And so the impossibilities of life, they cause us to struggle. Verse 19, they came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we cast it out? This was more than just with our notebooks open or uh, 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 ready to take notes, asking for a few tips. They're vexed. Listen, I, I don't get it. This is frustrating. Impossible situations in life, they cause frustration. For some people, they cause fear. They are afraid for the future or what's going to happen. In some, it causes depression. And some people, when they face impossible situations, they take wrong actions. I've known people in the past that when they're faced with impossible financial situations, Christians go to the casino or they buy hundreds of lottery tickets because they say it's not going to work. Maybe 
my number will come up. I was reading about a, a pastor named John Lindley, pastor of church in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was arrested and charged with robbery, armed robbery of nine local stores. The pastor, <laughs> apparently he needed money <laughs> and it wasn't coming in the offering. So he took matters into his own hand. That's not going to help you. In impossible situations, we take it personal. This is often what happened. We have situations, maybe we didn't even cause it. It's just the way things are. But sometimes we look at this and we say, what's wrong with me? What kind of loser Christian prays and it doesn't change? What kind of terrible Christian must I be? A terrible pastor that I am trying to see a change and it's just not working. We personalize it. And then, of course, we can finally accept our situation as being final. This is often what people do. What's the use? They hear a sermon on faith. Some of you, when I, you saw that this was a, a, a text about faith, some of you groaned on the inside of faith, faith, shmaith. It's not going to change. It's always going to be like this. What is the point of praying? What's the point of believing we just accept it like the man at the uh, pool of Bethesda who had been there for 38 years. Jesus Christ, God in human form, stands in front of him and asks him, do you want to be made well? But his response is, it's not going to happen because I don't have help. I can't walk. Other people are rude. On and on and on. In other words, Unbelief is birthed in our hearts. Why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. In other words, we have more confidence that our family are devils and resistant to the gospel than we do God. We have more confidence in demon spirits that hold keep people bound uh, than we do in God. We have more confidence in economic situation than we do God. That's what unbelief is. It's faith, but it's going the wrong way. You're believing the wrong thing. And when that happens, miracle power is blocked. It says of Jesus Christ, the one, he was able to raise the dead in his ministry, but it said he could not do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. Listen, I've been pastoring now for 36 years, and in 36 years, every single time I find someone who tells me it won't work, they won't change, they won't get saved, they are always right. Always. Every single time because unbelief stops the power of God. So in this text, we see something. God calls us to the impossible. God right now, he knows every single one of us and he knows our situation currently that is impossible. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. Listen, let me tell you something. Secondly, not only does God know about your impossible situation, he allows us to get into impossible situations. This is often what troubles some Christians. They think God's job is protecting us from all problems, right? A demon is coming. God says, no, no, no. Right? Every, everybody else gets sick. And God, no. Other people struggle economically. It's just God's job. But in fact, God allows. Jesus said we need to get into the boat and go on the other side. And when they're in the boat, a storm comes up and they're going to drown. Who told them to get in the boat? Jesus. Who knew the storm was coming? Jesus. So listen, you need to face this. We, we, we often think this is somehow everything is the devil, but God wants you to get into impossible situations. And finally, God calls us to impossible 
tasks. In John 6 and the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children, it started with a command. Jesus said, you feed them. <laughs> but Jesus, that would be impossible. He tells every believer, you are to bless the whole world. You are to go into the whole world. How could that possibly be possible? Let's talk secondly about the impossible God. So here's where I want to encourage you. Jesus boldly tells them, remember, they have just had a fail. It didn't work. And so now Jesus tells them boldly, God is able to do the impossible. Verse 20, nothing will be impossible. Knowing all of our situations, all of our problems, all the obstacles, nothing will be impossible. How could he make such a statement? That is, nothing is impossible with God because God is spirit. He is supernatural. God is not limited to the natural. We see in the Bible, Jesus walked on water. He walked through walls. He calmed uh, uh, storms at a word. Uh, he took uh, very little resources prayed over it, and it multiplied because he is spirit. We are physical. We are limited by time and space. God is not limited. He's supernatural. Years ago, when I first was praying for the sick, I was uh, preaching a, a, a revival meeting. A woman came up, said that she had uh, back problems and said she had surgery. I prayed for her. She was in terrible pain, and I told her, bend over, and she said, no, I can't. You see, I, listen, I don't want you to tell me your medical history. I, I said, bend over. And she got a funny look at her face, and she bent over, and all of a sudden she screamed, and she said, you don't understand the surgery. They inserted metal rods in my spine. It is impossible for me to bend over, but she did. How is that possible? Because God is not limited. He is spirit. He is supernatural. Nothing is impossible with God because God is bigger than every problem and every demon spirit. The Bible tells us, here's God. He, he says, let me, let me just give you a little picture in your head of how big I am. The whole earth, he says, yeah, I use that as a footstool. I rest my feet. The earth is like an ottoman to me. That's right. I, I can put my feet. That's how big. The creator of the universe. How was the world created? He spoke it into existence. I sometimes challenge people's faith with it. You mean to tell me you're worried about your family. You're worried about your money. You're worried... You mean to tell me that the God who created the whole world by speaking, somehow he's looking at your family going, dude, they are devils. Man, that is not true. Jeremiah 32, 17, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Jeremiah understands that. The one who created the world, therefore, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is impossible with God because he has no failures. God has a perfect track record. There has never been a time where God faced a situation and he said, wow, that is huge. Man, that, I had no idea how expensive it is around here. Never one time. And nothing is impossible because God does understand. I like it in, in the book of John chapter 6. The Bible says he tells them, you feed them. And they're like, uh, if we had all a bunch of money, it wouldn't be enough. And how can that possibly be true? But I love the phrase. It says, but he himself knew what he was going to do. Here is God. Listen, can I tell you right now, some of you, you are, you are sweating in your finances, you're sweating fruitfulness, you're sweating. God already knows 
who the answer is. He already knows where the answer is. He already, listen, this is God. He knows exactly how it's going to happen in order to bring change. Three times in the Gospels, Jesus declares that nothing will be impossible. Look at these three because he applies it in different ways each time. Matthew 17, 20, we read this, nothing will be impossible. And in this, he's talking about physical healing and supernatural deliverance. Listen, if you are sick in body tonight, Jesus says nothing will be impossible. But the doctor said, I don't care what the doctor said, nothing will be impossible. I've had it a long time. Nothing will be impossible. Healing, deliverance. There are people, maybe it is, that you personally have been struggling with a habit in your life. There's an area of bondage that you keep going back to again and again, and you're discouraged. I don't think I'm ever going to get over that. I'm never going to be free. But Jesus says here, that demon spirits have to go. Why? Because nothing will be impossible. Matthew 19, 26, he says it like this. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now he says, the impossible is applied to salvation and life transformation. There are are, are people, you are looking at people that you love that they are bound by sin, and you are thinking, oh, God, how could they ever change? They are getting deeper and deeper into sin. Jesus says, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Some of you here, you're you're looking, how could it be that I could be fruitful, that there could be someone who wants to change and leave their sin? With God all things are possible. Some of you in your marriage, you say, we have fallen out of love. How could we ever get our love back again? And God says, with God, all things are possible. Luke 1, 37, here's the third time. With God, nothing will be impossible. In this instance, this is something beyond nature. A virgin gets Pregnant. I don't know if you paid attention in biology when school or you were chasing girls, but that's not possible. You don't understand that? Ask your mom later on. But nonetheless, <laughs> here, here's the situation. Now it's applied. We have things that it, it would be absolutely impossible with my bills, with my income, with this economy. I often have pastors, they, they lament, they talk about ah, buildings in my place are so expensive. And when they get done telling me how hard it is, I often smile and say, it almost sounds like you did a miracle or something. <laughs> so God is able to change people, to change the factors. He is able to do what cannot happen in ourselves. See, when God wants to do the miraculous, he starts with the impossible. You understand when we talk about miracles, if you could do it, it's not a miracle. Right? There are people, if you say to me, it's a miracle, I exercise like crazy and I only ate vegetables and it's like, wow, I lost weight. No, that's not a miracle. You did that. Now, for me, that would be a miracle because vegetables just take up space. I could be eating meat. That would be a miracle. But (laughs) by definition, a miracle is something that you can't do. I'm not talking about, you know, I had a sore tummy and two weeks later it was better. Come on. If you're sick, probably a little bit of time it will give it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that you absolutely cannot do, and God starts with the impossible. This is why he allows us to get into impossible situation, because we need a miracle. This is how he shows us his love. This is a testimony to other people. When God 
gives you a miracle, I hope that you testify and tell the world because there are other people. I know people in the world today that they are encouraged to believe God for their backslidden and unsaved children because they've heard me testify of the miracle that God did in our daughter. That is why God lets you get into problems so that when you get help, you can bless other people. And finally, miracles give you a reference point for all of life and the future. This is, this is what God does. The disciples, when they came away from the feeding of the 5,000, the Bible says they carried away 12 baskets full of, of, of uh, food. This was a life lesson. God was more than just giving them leftovers. 12 disciples, 12 baskets. Why? Because later on in life, they're going to face another impossible situation and they're going to remember, ah, I remember. I had a whole basket left. God is able. How many believe that God is able? This is what you need is a reference point. Listen to this story just before Christmas in 2007. A single mother who was disabled, she attended a morning worship service with her mother who was not saved. The offering came around. Her mother saw her take out, this is an American dollar, she took out $5. But her mother knew that was all the money that she had in her purse, and she put it in the offering. Her mother wasn't a Christian. She said, don't, don't be stupid. You're giving away the little bit of money. You need more money. Don't give it away. But she had felt God speak to her that morning. And so she, in gratitude to God, gave it. After service, a couple in church came up to the pastor. They said that God had spoken to them and they had gone and bought Christmas gifts for this single mother and her, and, uh, her son. And so the pastor had uh, the gifts put in the car and uh, they did this uh, anonymously when the, when the mother... Uh, when this single mother and her mother got to the car, it's filled with presents. There was an envelope, and when she opened the envelope, in it was $500. What happened was her mother, who was not saved, began to cry, and she said, I never knew that the God you serve could do something this great. In just a little over an hour, God had multiplied. She had no idea when she gave that what God was going to do. But we serve a God who is able to do that. Not only that, her mother prayed in the car for salvation. Right there, God moved upon her heart. I'm talking about the God of the impossible. Let's look at one final thought. Let's talk about impossible results. Our text says nothing is impossible to God. But that is more than just information of, oh, wow, look what God can do. Jesus says that power God makes available to every believer. Verse 20, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Mountain, that was an ancient way. Your mountain is your, the biggest problem you face in life. I can't get over it. I can't dig, dig through it. You call that, that's my mountain. For some of you, your mountain is the, a problem you're facing right now. For some of you, it's a financial need. Others, it's a person. That is your mountain, that someone who's resisting the gospel. Others, it's a habit that you can't seem to break. And others, maybe it's an evil spirit that torments. And so Jesus says, God who can do the impossible, he gives you his power so that you can say to this mountain, be removed, and God goes to work. So he's talking about prayer. Listen, prayer, the point of prayer is not just discipline. It's good to be disciplined. The point of prayer is to not just make you feel good. I was feeling a little down today, so I prayed, and I feel so much better. 
That's not what prayer's for. I'm glad. If you feel good, that's tremendous. The whole point of prayer is to change things. They had brought their impossible situation. Jesus, we can't cast it out. Boy, I feel better just saying that. No. Jesus said, come out of him. And the boy was delivered. Listen, that's what should happen in prayer is things should change. So in prayer, you can ask God to uh, help and intervene, to supply, to save, to change, to deliver. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given. God, I am asking you to save this person. I'm asking but in this scripture, he says part of prayer, you can also speak into your situation. Verse 20, say to this mountain. In other words, say what you want to happen. They are God. They are going to get saved. This person, there will be miracle supply. There is going to be healing. There's going to be deliverance. And so in that, this triggers the miracle power of God. And he connects miracle power to faith. Verse 19, if you have faith as a mustard seed. You know what faith is? Faith is simply agreeing with God. God told us what he wants to happen in our situations. And so he says nothing is impossible. All you have to do is say, I agree. I agree with what God said. I say yes to God's love. I say yes to God's power, to God's promises. The blind men, Jesus asked them, do you believe that I am able? And they said, yes, Lord. Faith for many of us is in spite of. I'm going to agree with God in spite of my past history, my feeling. This is, listen, faith is not, I'm not going to try to whip you into a frenzy. How many of you believe Jesus? I said, how many of you believe Jesus? And we just like, eventually we jump to our, oh, I feel it, I feel it. <laughs> listen, I don't really care how you feel. That's not the point. Because faith is not a feeling. Sometimes it's in spite of our feelings, it's in spite of other people's words. Luke 5, 5, Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Listen, and in faith, we're not required to understand how. How will it change? I'm not in charge of change. That's God's problem. How is this going to work out? No clue. Not my department. My understanding is not necessary for God to work. And finally, let me encourage you. People are like, I don't have enough faith. I don't, I don't think I... He says, all you need is like a mustard seed. That was like really, really, really tiny. I have all the faith in the world. You don't need all the faith in the world. You got a little bit? Good, good enough. Isn't that what the father of the demon-possessed boy did? If you could believe, I could help. And he said, I sort of believe, but then I sort of not believe, right? Help my unbelief. I'm, I'm struggling here. And Jesus said, okay. And did a miracle. Listen, you're, you're, it's not like, like this meat. You have to get the meter up to here. And it's like, I can't believe enough. No. God is able. You know what? Faith pleases God. There is something about someone who says, my heavenly father loves me enough. He is powerful enough. He's going to help me. I want to tell you that pleases. You ever, what about the story of Peter? Jesus walking on the water and it, Jesus, I want to walk on water too. He's like, Peter, I'll be at the boat in a minute. Just hold your horses. That's not what he said. I want to walk. Come on. For what purpose? He's going to go out, walk to Jesus, and walk back. A miracle that has no purpose 
But the point of it is that faith pleases God. When God sees people, I am believing for my unsaved family. He says, I like that. I'm believing for a financial miracle. I like that. That pleases God. And then finally, our faith requires a step of obedience, a mustard seed. In other words, faith must be planted. Faith requires an action of faith and an action of obedience. Maybe for some of you, if you have never started tithing as a believer, you're never going to be blessed financially unless you're a tither. That's your mustard seed. I'm going to start believing God with the first 10%. For some of you, it's when God tells you an amount to give or maybe to give something to someone else. We obey. For others, maybe it is that we get prayer or we pray for ourselves. Maybe it is that we're going to pray for someone else as God directs us or witnessing, whatever. When we do that, everything changes. Jesus says the mountain moves. The impossible becomes possible. I want to close with a story just to encourage your faith. Listen to this. It's a true story. A woman named Maria Lopez, she was diagnosed with cancer in her neck. And the, the cancer was eating away at the bones, and so they bolted a halo. This is a metal cage. They attach it here, and literally they screw it into your skull to hold your head up. This lady telling the story, she knew Maria, as she actually worked for her, and she asked the doctor, why did you put, the, it's clearly painful and uncomfortable, why did you put that metal cage around her head? The doctor said, because if I didn't, her head would fall off. Her neck bones have degenerated to the point where her neck bones cannot support her head. And I asked the doctor, can they be repaired? He shook his head. He said, we can't ever take it off. Maria will just have to get used to living with it. She was in the hospital for some months. One day, Maria, who was a, a, a powerful Christian, she grabbed this lady's hand and she said, God told me it's not going to be long. Soon we're going to be able to take this thing off. One day they told her, we're releasing you, not because she was any better, but because she didn't have insurance. And so as they tell her, listen, there's nothing we can do for you. You're just going to have to go home. She said, no, I want you to take a new x-ray. I am not leaving the hospital with this halo, with this metal cage around my head. The doctor said, there is no point in taking an x-ray. Nothing has changed but she was fighting with the doctor. I want a new x-ray. The lady telling the story said she went back the next day and the doctor said, uh, we're releasing Maria today after, as soon as we take the halo off of her head. And uh, this lady is saying, I was shocked and I said to the doctor, you said her head would fall off without it. And she said, suddenly the doctor started acting strange. He's like sort of muttering to himself, looking left and right. And then he finally quietly said, her head won't roll. He said, wait, 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 what do you mean her head won't roll? You said the bones can't support her head. And the doctor said, the x-rays we took this morning indicate the bones in her neck have regenerated. He said, but doctor, you said that was impossible. He said, it is impossible. I shook my head, confused. Does that mean the original x-rays were a mistake? He said, not at all. We've got them right here for anyone to see. And so I said, so? The doctor said, there are things that I can't explain. Her bones have regenerated, and I'm telling you, they're strong enough to hold her head. That's all I know. So I said, doctor, is this a miracle? And he said, I don't know about miracles. That's Maria's department. <laughs> Maria tells me Jesus healed her. All I know is she's going home today. That is the God we serve. Thank God. Listen, so here's, here's the question. Does God love Maria Lopez more than you? Does God like play favorites? 
in all the rest. Not you, not you, not you, not Maria. <laughs> Somebody, that, they think that's how God is. Uh, not, no, no, listen. He says for all of us here, nothing will be impossible. So our job is just to say, God, I believe that. that I don't know how. I, you, know, you know what happened in the past. I'm going to believe you, or I'm going to believe you again, or I'm going to believe you in spite of. Jesus says we do that. Mountains can move and nothing will be impossible. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Thank God. Thank God for his goodness. Now, my challenge to you, first of all, is those who don't know Jesus. The greatest miracle that you can ever have is not a miracle in your money. It's not a miracle of healing. It's a miracle of life transformation. Jesus said you must be born again. It would, be, it would take a miracle for God to change you from the inside out. And that is exactly, that's the greatest miracle that God does. People all over this place have experienced that exact thing is God reached down and has done a miracle in them. They are no longer bound by habits, chains they can't break. They're no longer filled with guilt all of the time. They no longer are depressed and afraid of the future. Jesus has done a miracle. There are people maybe here tonight that you have never experienced that miracle, then my challenge to you is to turn to the only one who can do a miracle from the inside out. How many here, you are not born again? You know that. God would not be pleased with the way you're living. But you believe that Jesus died on the cross and you want to turn from your sin and believe God for a miracle. If that's what you want, I want you to do one thing. I want you to lift up your hand. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I am not saved. I see that hand. God bless you, man. Thank you. God bless you. How many others? Lift up your hand. Join this one. I'm not saved. I know it. Or you're backslidden. In the past, you were saved, but you turned your back on God. Lift up your hand. I need to get right with God all across this place. Thank you. Thank you. People are being honest before God. Thank God. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Unsaved your backs in one final call because we're going to pray for some other things. Now, I want those that lifted their hands, I want you to stand up. Don't be shy. Stand up right now. I'm going to have some pray with you. Stand up. God bless you. God bless you. Come here. Come here. Come to the front. We're going to have someone pray for you. Lead them in a sinner's prayer. Thank God. Help my brother there. Wants to pray. This lady, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Just kneel down right here. Amen. In Espanol? Maria. Okay. And you speak Spanish? No. Okay, Romanian. Okay, good. Right, you got it. Thank God. Then, amen. I'm, I'm challenging believers. We're going to have a very specific prayer in a, in a few moments, but I'm, I am challenging. I, I'm praying that this is more than information. I'm praying that God will stir your hearts. I want, what we're going to do, instead of just coming to the altar, I want the ushers, the ushers are going to pass out a, uh, a piece of paper quickly while I'm talking right now. Do that. And some pens. If you need a pen, I don't believe that people should have just general faith, general prayers. In a minute, you're going to get a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, it is very, very specific. You're going to see on it is, first of all, the scripture, Matthew 17, 20. Jesus said to them, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. It will move and nothing will be impossible for you. But under that, there is space 
three different lines for three different kinds of miracles. I've found it very helpful through the years that people get very specific with God about what they need. And you're going to find on here the first section, the first line is, I believe God for a miracle within me. There are people here, you are bound perhaps with a habit. Maybe it is you're bound by fear or there is an inability in some way. Then I want you to write down, what is it that you are going to believe God for a miracle? What do you need God to do inside of you? For some of you, it may be I need help to forgive. I need God to put love in my heart for my spouse. I don't know what... You are the one who needs to let God know what you need. The second section, the second line that you have room there is, I believe God for a miracle in this situation. Some of you have problems. Maybe it's work or business. Maybe it is healing. You have a problem in your health. Maybe it is, a, perhaps as a, there may be pastors that are watching this. You need a miracle with buildings. If God wants us to reach the UK, then he is going to have to help us get buildings when they're expensive. Is that right? Or else we have to send a whole bunch of people to hell. We can only have churches in very poor, very rundown areas. No, listen, I believe that God is a miracle worker. That would be a, a for instance... I believe God in this situation. Write down what it is you're going to believe God for. The third section is, I believe God for a miracle in this person. Maybe it is you have a loved one who is not saved. My wife and I, we had our daughter's name, Emily. We would pray and bring her before the Lord. We're not praying, Lord, save the world in general. God, we need a miracle in Emily. And we would cry out to God. Maybe that is. You have a family member, someone you're believing God. God, you need to do a miracle in them. Maybe it's not salvation. Maybe there's just someone, their heart has become hardened in marriage or in some other way. God, I need a miracle in me. I need a miracle in this situation. And God, I believe you for a miracle in this person. Now, they're going to sing. I want you to spend a few moments writing that down and then just hold on to that paper. This is for you. You're not going to turn this in. You're going to keep this. So don't be afraid. If you put something personal on there, that's fine. No one else is going to see that. But I want you to hold on to that. They're going to sing for a, a few minutes to give you time to write it down. And then when everyone is finished writing something down, then we're going to hold them up before the Lord and we're going to believe God for some very specific things. And I'm telling you, when I've done this in our church, people hold on to this, and as God answers, they're able to tick them off. They're able to testify of what God's done. I want our brother to sing while people are coming. Right now, God bless you. Do you sing? Give people time to write things down.
just sang it, you wrote it down in some specific areas, and now we are going to agree there is power in corporate prayer. You're going to continue to pray for yourself. You're going to keep this piece of paper. But first, the Bible says when there are people agreeing, there's power in agreement. How many of you believe that God's going to help us? I want you to lift up that piece of paper in the air. By lifting it up, God knows what is written on it. And we are going to, first of all, pray together and ask God to do these miracles for us. And then we're going to praise God in advance. We're going to thank God for something that hasn't even happened yet. But we know because his word is true, it's going to happen. God's going to help us. How many of you believe that? Are you ready? Amen. Say this out loud. Say, Father God. I am your child, and you love me. You know exactly what's going on. You see the problem. You see the people. You see my heart. But because you love me, you promise me nothing is impossible, and mountains can be moved. I am asking you in these areas, these needs that I've written down, I'm believing you to do a miracle. I speak into these problems. You will be removed. People will be saved. I will be changed. You are a miracle working God. And I thank you in advance because nothing is impossible for you. In Jesus' name, I claim it. Now let's praise God together right now. Oh God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb of God, worthy is the Lamb of God that 
God, I thank you for provision. God, I thank you for deliverance, Lord God. I thank you for the people you're going to save. My God, I thank you for miracles of healing. Oh, God, I thank you for miracle buildings. God, miracle resources. You are able, Lord God. You are more than able, Lord God. your power. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Hallelujah. Let's give God a clap offering right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Now, I want to encourage you. Keep that piece of paper, whether you put it in your Bible, you put it in your purse or somewhere where you always have it. Some of you may be helpful. You take a picture of it. So you always have your phone. You can always have your prayer request with you and be believing God, be calling out on God. This must change. That mountain's got to move. God, you're going to do in these specific areas and I want you to believe, I'm, I'm telling you in my church, I get testimonies from people, these specific things, they will show me, sometimes the piece of paper later on, there it is, God did a miracle in me, there it is, God did a miracle in that problem, God did a miracle in this person. I'm telling you, we serve a miracle working God. And when you do that, testify, because the, the law of life is what you testify, God gives you more of. Whatever you testify to, he'll give you more of. You tell people how good God is in healing, he'll give more. You tell God or tell people how good God is to save, he'll save more. And on and on, I'm, I'm challenging you. I believe that I'll get testimonies. If you will ultimately give it to the pastors, it will encourage me when I hear what God has done for you. I love to see people get miracles. Because I have experienced, I've been so blessed so far in all the miracles that God has given me so far. And so I know God does not love Pastor Greg more than he loves you. If he can give me miracles, he can give you miracles. And so God is going to help us. Thank God. I'm going to turn the service back to the pastor. It's been wonderful to be with you. I'll see you next year at uh, some point in time. And uh, we'll rejoice together in the goodness of God. Let's give God a clap over you. Pastor's coming right now. Praise God. Amen. We have been so blessed uh, by Pastor Greg's ministry uh, today and all this conference. In fact, his life. And uh, very thankful to have leadership uh, like Pastor Mitchell. And what a blessing. What a word and what a change is going to bring to our lives. Let's bow our heads together. Brother Andrew Waring, if you'd ask the Lord's blessing as we're dismissed. Amen. Be a blessing to someone before you leave. Amen. God bless you.